we talked about okay and and last week we talked about the week and how important it is and it really is every seven days it has nothing to do with the moon i saw a lot of a couple of years ago a lot of people saying anciently it was all the moon not the week the week is always in the bible is always just seven straight days no matter where the moon is and the Jews have been very good at counting it and the Christians after them since 500 BC. And slide number 14 is showing how even when Pope Gregory the 13th <clears throat> corrected, did a great job of correcting the Julian calendar to a calendar that I can use all from, the, from Adam up till now. The Gregorian is great. He did not goof up the week. So Thursday, the 4th of October in 1582 was followed by Friday the 15th. They skipped 10 days, but Thursday was followed by Friday. And the week is actually its own separate calendar of seven days. And this, it doesn't even have anything to do with the Gregorian except, uh, well, it doesn't really have anything to do with it. We just do it that way. We, we show it that way because we care about the week. So the main thing on this whole last week is that when we talk about the Sunday on which the Savior resurrected, the first day of the week, it's the same as the first day of the week is now. So now you're caught up to where we are. There's several calendars based on the week. The simplest is nothing but a collection of weeks. And most people don't even think of it as a calendar. I've got, I'll read the slide for those, anybody not seeing them. It's a picture of a priest and it says, anciently calendars were both agricultural and religious and were controlled by priests for the offering of sacrifices on certain specified holy days. And I show a day of atonement sacrifice in the picture. Now, So that shows that priests have to do with calendars is the main point there, good or bad. And here's, well, let's go to the next slide. The next slide is the priest calendar groups weeks into sets of 24, named for Hebrew families and put in order by King David. And there's the, the reference is First Chronicles 24, 1 to 18. King David didn't wasn't allowed to build the temple. That was Solomon after him. But he did the putting in order of the priests. So there's 24 families. I think it was uh, 16 from Aaron's older son and eight from his younger son. And <clears throat> Most people don't think of this as a calendar. It's just the order in which the priests served. There would be a priest from each of these 24 families and they would serve for one week, beginning at noon on Saturday, and they'd be replaced the week noon on the next Saturday. And so the day on the, this priest calendar starts at noon. And I got that from Adersheim's book on the temple where he talks about how the priests did. He's a Jew that was converted to Christian and has a lot of good material on the temple. The book is called The Temple. And so the priest calendar of the day starts at noon. David drew lots on these 24 names for all of the, his grand, all of the children of uh, Aaron. And, or uh, children or grandchildren, I forget which. And, you know, we talk about drawing lots to choose the Lord's will. This is the best example I know. He was, as far as I know, just trying to be fair and, and have everybody take turns, which is how white people normally draw lots. But these all names, in a few slides, well, look, these names all mean something. And it's like every week is named for these things. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, they talk about what priest was in the temple on what day. and by 
by their correlation of the Dead Sea Scrolls, I was able to uh, to know exactly. I've got it tuned. We'll we'll show a couple slides on that. But I'm using the actual order of the priests that is recorded in Dead Sea Scrolls and in Josephus and other places. But the amazing thing is going to be that sacred events all through history happen on days of these weeks that mean things. Um, I will talk more about this as we go. Let's, the next slide is 17, go to that one. The first day of each, of each week of the free cycle is holy, beginning Saturday at noon. So the holy day, is Saturday at noon till Sunday at noon. And a new priest would then begin to preside. And I have a picture of a temple priest. Um, so the next slide is 18. Christian Sunday worship might be best, might best be held before local noon, which time is more sacred being holy on the priest calendar. So I just have a picture of a Christian church most Christian churches held some kind of a Sunday school in the morning of Sunday. Easter services are often sunrise and almost always in the morning. I don't know if people just felt that or what, but that's that's the best time. If you have to meet in the afternoon and noon, okay, but it won't be holy on this particular calendar. And the afternoon, we talked about it the, the first day on what is noon, and it has to do with sundial noon not daylight savings time or even uh, even standard time, like standard time zones, like mountain time. And we learned how to correct for that before. So you can go back to those slides if you missed that. This priest calendar is extremely important. Slide 19, every sacred calendar has major and minor holy days. Those major days are begin, the major begin in names that are in red and minor in blue. I did not have a source for this from anything but all the dates I've done. But when I looked at the important dates, they were almost all separated by four. So it's a very simple pattern that every fourth day is, every fourth week, I'm sorry, uh, is a little as a major holy day on the first Saturday to Sunday, and the, the others are minor. Uh, for instance, day number 21, well, we'll get to that, but Yahim, or how, however you say that, something like Yahim, or in English, anyway, means arise. And that has everything to do with the resurrection. And the Sunday morning on which Jesus arose was that Sunday morning. And that's that's going to be a major holy day. And Yeshua, number nine, is Yeshua, Jesus. And that's going to be the day Jesus goes to the temple as a, as, as a child. That's the day that the angel comes to um, Mary at the Annunciation saying she's going to have a baby. Uh, a, a lot of the stuff on that day have to do with Je has to do with Jesus. So you see what I'm saying? They those days were just picked randomly by Lot by David, but they're meaningful, which is why it's worth your time to learn. Okay, number nineteen. This is my best effort using Strong's Concordance and Hebrew dictionaries to translate these names. And I don't feel like reading them all, but well, I'll read some, especially the, the red ones. So I always say Jehoiarib because that's what it looks like. And we say Jehoiakim for a king. And it means something like chief or the leader and it's the first, the name means something along those lines, and it is the first week. It is the leader. The second one, I, I will read them. The second one means prophet. The third means consecrated. 
And the uh, covenant in Boise was on a day that is consecrated. And that's what we were doing. Of all the things we're doing here, there was a consecration covenant day. The fourth one is barley, and barley is what's used in first fruits. This is the equivalent of first fruits. And the first fruits, um, the, the Pentecost was on the Feast of First Fruits. And at the time of Christ, the day of Pentecost was on barley, first fruits. That was what was offered. The, uh, anyway. The next name, Malchai, is very like, very much like Melchizedek, and it means king, and it has to do with kings. Uh, we don't need to read all of them. Oh, Abid we have to read some. Abijah means father, and, and actually the Ab is father, and Abijah is Jehovah, and it means father of God, meaning father chosen by God. The day that John the Baptist, the, the, the father, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, is one big day in the temple, uh, was on the, this day. I mean, he's of this, this is in the Bible, in Luke chapter 1, verse about 5, 4, 5, it says that Zacharias was of the course of, and they, they say, Abias in Greek. So they're telling you what course he is from. There were so many priests, so many descendants of Aaron by that time, that they drew the priest by lot. And so a lot of priests would only get one week in their whole life to go in and, and, and uh, do the sacrifices, et cetera, preside in the temple. So we know what week he went to the temple because it tells us what course. That's one of the hidden things that, that's important to understand. If people don't know these courses and these names, they would just say, yeah, whatever, yeah, Zacharias is of that lineage. But that's telling you when he went, and it's, in the, it's going to be at the autumn equinox. I'm, I mean, the winter equinox. So it's a midwinter thing. And then John the Baptist is born the fall nine months later, following October. So you could have discounted back nine months, but the point is, it's all consistent with this name. Uh, other key names are, I'm looking this down, there's one that says chair, and it means like the chairperson. Uh, it's like chairman or chairwoman. I needed short names, so it's just chair. But they'll say that man, he, he was the chair of the committee. Uh, gathered is important, priest is important. And then arise, I already told you about. So anyway, the names are important. And that's why I believe it's worth your time to learn the priests. And that it's a calendar that's been used from Adam. The day Adam first breathes is on one chief. And I, I believe he's ordained on that day. This is, this, these are very often ordination days. Okay, next. And let's see, I'm going to do 20 minutes and 20 minutes in a row. I'm just about ready to stop so I can have enough time for questions. Uh, now, this is an important concept. A calendar with a fixed number of days. I'm on slide 21. If a calendar has a fixed number of days in its cycle, and as it rolls through history, then it only requires knowing one the date of one event to determine every other day. So I have a picture of a gear rolling along, a rack and pinion gear, if you know what they are, where the one gear just rolls along a, a straight line rack. So if you know where to position that gear, and it's like every day, every 24 weeks it repeats, and the weeks are never interrupted with leap days or anything like that, then knowing one day locks in everything all through history. That's the power of these day counts like a week. If you know what day of the week it is, it really helps avoid confusion. It's a double check. When I write dates, I, I almost always write the day of the week in my work. I won't just say it's March 4th. I'll say Tuesday, the 4th of March, 
in this year. And if if somebody's not sure, it's a double check on the date because it was March 4th a Tuesday or wasn't it? And I, if I, so I've got them both. Now, here's the one date that we're going to line up. The eyewitness Josephus records that the Jewish temple was burned, and he, he doesn't call it Sunday. He says the day after the Sabbath, on the 10th of Ab, and he gives, that's the, Ab is the fifth month, or Av in modern Hebrew, Hab in the old Hebrew. Uh, the 10th day of the fifth month called Ab, on the calendar he was using, which is very close to the regular Hebrew calendar, but see, it said, he said it was a Sunday. So if you were unsure of what day 10th of Ab was, and say, well, I'm not sure about the moon, it might have been this day, it might have been that day, because the Ab, the Hebrew calendar, is done by the moon. See how wonderful it is that he said the day of the week, too? That locks it in. And, on, and it, it was the 10th, in fact, of Ab, on the, on the perpetual calendar, that I believe is correct, or that God is using, in AD 70. Others noted that the week was Jehoiarib. Yeah, they noticed, they said, what priests? Because it was the beginning of the priest cycle. That's the first one. And, uh, and if you look now at a Sunday, the 10th of Ab, uh, that was Sunday, 3rd of August in AD 70. And if that was Jehoiarib, then you can match up that one day. So I say that ties the day, one Jehoiarib, to Sunday, the 3rd of August, AD 70, on the Gregorian calendar, the one we use today. And I use that almost exclusively. Uh, uh, historians use the Julian calendar for dates before 15, before Pope Gregory the 13th on 1582. I don't use that because it, it does, it's, it's bad, it's, it got, it's incorrect. And as I said, the Gregorian is good all the way back to Adam, which is really, I think, inspired or lucky or something, because that I'm amazed that it works. So once we have that date from Josephus, and also from several in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that all agree, that determines all dates on the priest calendar. Now, we've, that's my 20 minutes, so I'm stopping on slide 22. And now let me go to the last almost 20 minutes to do some questions. Uh, here's the ones we did not get to last week. We talked about how the stars rise four minutes earlier every night. We talked about how the moon, uh, jumps all over on the horizon and goes to 13 degrees, which is almost three times the distance between the pointers of the Big Dipper, which is five degrees. It, it jumps a lot every night because it goes around it once a month instead of once a year. Month, of course, is named for moon, lunar, lunar month. Okay, so now new, a new question that was sent in before. What calendar did the Jews use during the time of Jesus? Excellent question. Because it's not the standard traditional Hebrew calendar, which was done by Hillel II in about AD 200. Uh, what happened in AD 70 was that's when Jerusalem fell. We just looked at that slide. Jews flee all over, and now they're all over, and they all want to worship on the same day, and they needed a calendar that was not determined by the moon and sun and by looking at it. That's what they use today. It goes back to AD 200. Not bad for being that old. Um, what did they use at the time of Jesus? They used an observational calendar where they would go out, and they actually held a party. Uh, on the first day of, on a potential first day of the month, when they knew it was near a moon, new moon, after sunset, they had a few trusted observers. And they would go out, and if they could see the little skinny crescent of the new moon, 
then that started a new month. And if they couldn't see it, then it would be the next day. And if it was cloudy, they would do a calculation. But they actually held a dinner for these guys. When somebody saw they'd all go back and celebrate, well, it became a holy day. The first day of every month was a holy day. And they have a little party and feast just to get people to go look at the moon. Anyway, I, it's called the Judean calendar. And it's important to know in the book of John, when he says it was the Jews' Passover, that Jesus, Jesus, now this is another, this is too long, but I'll do it short. Jesus and his disciples ate what they called the Passover dinner on Thursday night. They were using what I call the Galilean calendar. And it's actually the calendar of Moses. The others were all using the calendar they brought back from the captivity from Babylon. But it's also a correct calendar that dates back to Abraham farther than Moses. And John refers to that as, he says, I think it's John 19 and 14. He says that the, the, the Friday, um, that, that Friday evening, after they had eaten their Passover, he says that day would be, the, that night would be the Passover of the Jews. And we read that and say, oh, yeah, the, the, the Jewish Passover. Well, he wasn't saying of the Jews. He's saying of the Judeans. He's saying we ate the Galilean Passover last night, but Saturday, Friday night, we'll start the, the Passover of the, of the Judeans. And so it's important that Judean is translated Jew in the New Testament in King James. So anyway, they use this observational Judean calendar is the answer to that question. And, uh, and it usually agreed with the regular calendar. Next question, why are there multiple different sacred calendars? Why not just one? Ah, I don't really know, but my guessing from, from it's more than a guess, it's based on all the 400 observations of dates I've got. They're used for different purposes. Uh, one, just like we'll use the Gregorian calendar for what day of the week, but they go to work and they have a fiscal calendar that starts in, let's say, September. And we have another calendar. We have a daylight savings calendar and it changes on this day. And so there's different calendars. And one of these calendars, like I said, this one we just looked at, the priest calendar, it's for priesthood things, priesthood ordinances, priesthood ordinations, uh, priesthood activities. It's not used for birthdays, for instance. So the Hebrew and sacred round are used for birthdays and maybe some others. The Enoch is used for covenants. It's marriage dates. Uh, it's also some priesthood things. I haven't got the exact use of each down, but it's pretty clear that, for instance, almost nobody's birthday is a, is a holy day on the Enoch calendar. It's just not used for birthday. Okay, next question. However, I'm surprised at how many there are. I mean, I've got 16, well, eight, it's, eight, it's, it's, I guess it's 10 actually, 10 different sacred calendars and then, and then some have a multiple use and I've discussed that. Uh, let's go to the next question. <clears throat> But I don't know what all ten are used for exactly. Wait, I can I can add something else there. So there'll be some special event, and it'll be holy on let's say six or eight calendars. Those calendars tell a story. One will say it's a day of decision. Another will say it's a a day of death, and and it's like okay, uh, it might be a serious decision. And another will say. Anyway, they tell things and you put all the different little pictures and meanings together and it'll tell a whole story. And that's when you know you have a date, right? Because if that story matches the story that's happening on that day, it's like, whoa, this is amazing. And that's what's kept me doing this. Question, next question. Denver gave the definition of the term new heavens and new earth. And he mentioned that the pole star changes seven times every 25, 
1920 years. True. Does that mean each pole star change? Oh, does it come out even? Does it? Can you divide that number 25,000 by seven? And is it an equal number for each? No, I believe. I have written a paper. If you look on my website, there's something about seven pole stars. And I believe I have identified what the seven pole stars are. They are not equally spaced. Uh, and I, I don't know exactly. On a lot of things, I can tell you the exact day it starts, the exact day that a new, a new uh, age of Aquarius starts. I don't know the exact day of the pole star because I don't know what calendar gov governs it. And I'm not positive, but I have all seven right. But my best shot is in a paper called Seven Pole Stars that was early this year or late last year. Okay, in the last seven minutes, there's one more question. And I believe I can handle it in seven minutes. We'll see. Uh, the question is, what, what is the shape of the Earth? And <clears throat> meaning especially, you know, what's all of this about a flat Earth? that's going on is how i interpret that question and is it really spherical or what do i believe have i looked at that stuff i've had several people take this uh, flat earth very seriously enough which i didn't at first so i watched several of the videos and there's a video out there that of a guy's book being summarized that's 200 reasons 200 proofs that the earth is flat so i said okay we all have to be like children in this new system. We are not to be think we're smart and know everything. So let me try to just forget everything that I learned <clears throat> and see what the guy has to say. I will divide the arguments into two kinds. The first kind really intrigues me. Of this guy's 200 proofs, the first 30 were all the same one at very at, at different locations on earth. And they were all saying, we can see farther than you would expect on a round earth. And they gave at a certain distance, how far, how tall you should be able to see. At first I thought they did the math wrong. I closed, I stopped it right there. I, I, I can do that math. In fact, I, we've done that. I did that in school. Well, where's the horizon? You're on a boat. How far can you see? Where's the horizon? And <clears throat> I did the calculation and I got exactly the answers they got. And they they had done the calculations right. They had done the observations right. I will assume they're not lying about that. So they bring up a good point. <clears throat> you can see farther than expected. Let me give one answer to that. I started to write a paper with the answer and then I realized I didn't I didn't have my stuff down enough, and I wasn't sure I would convince anybody. But let me tell you something about sunrise and sunset. And this all has to do with refraction. Uh, you can, the answer is going to be something like the air at level is so thick when you're looking through all atmosphere, it bends the light a lot. When you watch a sunrise, let's suppose you're on the ocean. And so your horizon is exactly flat ocean. When you see the sun rise and the whole ball of the sun is just touching the ocean, so it's just right on top of the ocean, it actually has not risen yet. It is actually entirely below the horizon. And there is so much refraction. And, it, and, and it's also differential refraction, which will make it look flat. So when you see the sun on the horizon, you're not going to see a ball. You're going to see a flattened ellipse. And it's not even an ellipse. It's the lower down you go, the more it's flattened. Anyway, the point is you can see when you're looking straight, you can see down around the earth. So I believe those statements. You can see around the earth. That does not mean the earth is flat. Okay, but it does mean it should be explained. Anytime somebody has an observation, it should be explained. If the per first thing that pops in your head is the earth must be flat, then you got to say, well, what are all the other proofs that the earth is round? So let's look at those. So I'll say that I believe that happens. 
it's, I don't believe it proves that the Earth is flat. But it needs to be explained mathematically and carefully with, with physics. Okay, I will give you what I believe is the simplest, best proof that the Earth is a sphere. It is not flat. If you look at all the, at first, I didn't think they had a model. I didn't think they could even draw a map, but they have. They've, they've drawn a map, and it's the same kind that's on the UN picture of the world. It's an equal latitude projection. And so the North Pole is in the center, and the South Pole is the, the whole circumference. And so they have Antarctica going all the way around the circumference of the bottom. They have it fixed, and so the sun that seems to go around every day, they have it just going in a circle. The reason they put the North Pole in the center is because all the stars seem to go around a point in the sky, and that point is right over the North Pole. If the Earth is spinning, that's understood, because the Earth is spinning, the stars are fixed, then they look like they go around if you're on, on the Earth. But if the Earth is fixed, it means the whole sky is going around. Okay? So they got that part fine. Uh, well, I mean, not fine, but they've got, they got it. They, the flat Earth guys. I call them they. Okay, here's the proof that that does not work. That's fine. Uh, not even fine. It's... Uh, appears acceptable if you don't dig very deep for the northern hemisphere and i'm sure you've all seen oh, with all the astronomy and hubble you must have all seen a picture of all the stars going around a circle around the north pole hopefully you've seen that if you put your camera out at night all the stars you pointed at the north star polaris and all the stars seem to circle that the sun also seems to circle it, but that's so far away, it's kind of in the south. Just look north. And uh, by the way, speaking of looking north, tomorrow night, Monday night, if your sky is clear after sunset, look up and there might be a really good meteor shower. The draconids might be really good this year. So I meant to say that too. Okay, you look north, you set up your picture, the stars are all going around counterclockwise and, you, and the flat earth guy is gonna say, because the earth is fixed and the sky is spinning, okay? Here's the problem. If you now go down like I did to a country like Brazil, which is south of the equator, and you look up in the sky, all of the stars are also going around a point, but they're going clockwise instead of counterclockwise. The sky is spinning the other direction. In South America, south of the equator. I've looked at many flat areas, nobody has touched that. And it's so simple, it goes the other way. I got it one more minute. It also works for the sun. And I was on my mission there for two years, and I guess I'm slow at reorienting because we're used to the sun rising in the east and it goes into the southern part of the sky and it sets in the west, and that's the Earth is turning. Like I said, down there, it's the other direction. It sets, it rises in the east still, but instead of, it goes the other clockwise direction, it goes in the north part of the sky. And I refused for two years to believe the sun could possibly be in the north part of the sky, rising in the east, setting in the west. So for me, it turned around my whole world, and I saw the sun rise in the west every day and go around backwards. And at night, all the stars were going around backwards. Anyway, that to me is the best proof. If the Earth were fixed, and there's a zillion other, all the real proofs are from astronomy. One final thing, I got one minute by my time. <coughs> Or two. Um, I was I going to say the stars backwards and oh, I lost it. Looked at the clock. Um, oh, I was going to say the Egyptians. 
the Egyptians were much more sophisticated than what I just said. They didn't have to go down to South America. And just by changing latitude, they saw that the, the North Star went up or down in, lat in, in heights above the, it's called altitude, above the horizon. When they went 500 miles north from Siani to Alexandria, they measured that the pole star changed seven and a half degrees above the horizon. And if you think about it and draw a good picture, that means that 500 miles is seven and a half degrees of a circle or one fiftieth, that's one fiftieth of a circle. So they multiplied 50 times 500 and said the diameter of the earth is 25,000 miles. That's right, the diameter of the earth, it's round and it's 25,000 miles. That was known in ancient Egypt. They did not think the earth was flat. So the people would say, well, it's NASA conspiracy. No, no, this is like, go out and look at the sky yourself and the stars, the stars will tell you the answer and they, and even the planets and the sun. So there you go, the earth is a sphere, I believe. And, they, and when I was a kid, they said, oh, we've learned it's pear-shaped. And then when I started to study that, holy cow, the pear-shaped is like a couple of miles, a few, um, a couple of miles off the sphere. Yeah, it's a little bulgy here, a little bulgy at the equator, a little less at the poles, but for all practical purposes, on an 8,000-mile diameter, it only changes a few miles. It's really close to a sphere. Okay. There you go. There's my, I'm quitting on time. Um, oh, I didn't have time for any new questions. Write in any new questions to questions at johnpratt.com. Because I just finished the old one. Okay, I'll turn it back to Glenn. Okay. Hey, thanks everyone for joining. Hey, in the chat, um, just want to bring your attention to Daniel Hughes. Uh, he gave uh, or he uh, placed a file that you could download that uh, show the star trails as John was talking about. You could actually see oh, it the, the lens open. And so I'll put that there. We'll include that with the uh, with the other files that we have. So with that, um, just a reminder, we're going to place this recording on Restoration Archives so you could uh, reference it. And if you need to uh, fill in your notes, uh, I was trying to take some notes as I was doing it. Uh, you could go and review it later. So thank you, John. And we you are on for next week also, right? You bet. Okay. Well, we'll uh, conclude for now. And uh, and like John said, if you have any questions for him, just put questions at johnpratt.com, right? Right. All right. All right. Thanks, all. We'll conclude. Thanks. Thanks. So much. Bye. Bye-bye.